God's people said. Amen. All right. Take your Bibles with me and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And I tell you what, I think we're going to go ahead and keep everybody in here today. Uh, so kids, we'll just uh, stay here in the main service today and uh, it'll be fine. All right. Amen. Let's try and obey the Lord. And because we've been talking this week, uh, or excuse me, this month, it has been family month here uh, at Rome Baptist Temple. And I believe we need help in our homes. I believe America needs help in her homes. I believe that with all of my heart. And uh, if we look here in Hebrews chapter 11, I want to read a few things here. In Hebrews chapter 11, and then we're also going to be in Luke chapter 17. Hebrews 11 and Luke chapter 17. Hebrews 11, let's all stand please for the reading of the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. All right. Hebrews 11, and look if you would please down at verse number 7. Hebrews 11 and verse number 7. By faith... Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now turn, if you would, to Luke 17. Luke 17. And I want you to look at verse number 25. Luke 17 and verse 25. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. It actually goes on likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Lord, I pray, God, that you would help us this morning. I know I need your help. I pray, God, that uh, our hearts, our minds would fall under the authority of your word. And I pray that the Holy Ghost would have liberty today that you would touch our hearts with your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. We have been looking in Genesis, am I on there? There we go. Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8. Matter of fact, I'm actually debating at this very moment if we'll uh, look further about the life of Noah tonight or if I'm going to go on with our verse by verse study through the book of Matthew and uh, I would hope that all of those have been a help to you uh, I have enjoyed our verse by verse study but I might if the Lord allows me I might try and finish up what we've been doing since we are ending our view of uh, saving our homes I might try and finish up some things tonight from the life of Noah. But this morning, Lord willing, we're going to look at the New Testament scriptures concerning the life of Noah. And we're not told a lot in the New Testament, but what we are told, we're told enough. What kind of a time was it in the days of Noah? There in Luke 17, we are told some specific things. If you look there again, it says in verse 26, As it was in the days of Noah. Just like it was back then, it is going to be in the days of the Son of Man. 
And then in verse 27, we're told the details. And it tells us here, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. I want to put this in a perspective here that we might be able to understand a little more clearly, but it tells us that this was a time of self-centeredness. They were full of spoiling themselves. They were full of senseless living. They were full of shallowness in their daily lives. By the way, can I tell you this, in the day and time in which we live... We, our culture, is more concerned about silliness than we are with substance. Our culture is more concerned about veneers than they are with values. Our culture is more concerned about gold than they are with God. Our culture is more concerned about the picture of things than they are in the reality of things. Literally, we have doomed ourselves to a life of stupidity and a life of superficiality and a life of sensuality And uh, we see that they were more interested in indulging themselves and the life of iniquity than they were with in pleasing God. Friend, let me tell you something. That is what doomed Noah's generation. They were not interested in anything good. They were not interested in anything that was godly. And let me tell you, our homes have become dens of iniquity. As a matter of fact, we're living in a time where people would say, well, I would never do that, but they would watch it on TV. I would never participate in something like that, but I would watch it on the internet. I would never uh, allow that, allow that in my home, and yet that is exactly what we have done. We have allowed it into our home through various types of media, through various types of applications, and we need a return to God because that is exactly what was going on. I'm going to live according to my indulgences. I am going to please myself. I would rather live a life of convenience rather than a life of conviction. And friend, it is a dangerous time in which we are living. That's why they would say, oh, well, whatever I want, I'm not going to uh, tell myself no. As a matter of fact, take your Bibles. I want to show you this. Turn with me quickly to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is an intriguing book, and we're mentioned, uh, some things are mentioned in the scripture here uh, that explains to us exactly where we are in our lives. Matter of fact, if you would, look at what the Bible says in uh, um, uh, Ecclesiastes 1 and verse number 17. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is vexation of spirit. Look at chapter 2, verse number 4. I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. And I planted trees in them of all kind of fruits. I made me pools of water. To water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also I have had great possessions of great and small uh, cattle above all that were in Jerusalem. 
them before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. Look at verse number 10. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion in all of my house. Verse number 26. For God giveth to man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. And friend, if that's all we want to do is to heap to ourselves pleasures and conveniences and those things that please our flesh, it is no different than it was in the days of Noah, how that they ate, they drank, and they didn't stop there. They went further and they experimented in the things of sensuality where it says that they took into them wives of all which they chose and they gave and it's no different than what is going on today. The Bible teaches us very clearly that we are living in a time that Jeremiah 5.8 says they were as fed horses in the morning, every one neighed after his neighbor's wife. And we have become so debased in our, in our culture and debased in our character that all we're doing, we're, we're living in a time where we throw things away, including our homes, including our marriages, and we're just not happy anymore. Very few times do you see somebody or see a couple that's in it for the long haul. Say amen right there, friend. That is the problem of where we're at. Our ceremonies have no power. Our vows have no truth. Our pledges have no reality. And friend, as we look into the New Testament concerning the life of Noah and how we we saved our, how he saved his home we need to have the same attitude the same desire the same hope the same joy and the same power that we would consecrate ourselves unto the Lord for the saving of our homes look if you would again with me I want to read verse number 27 in Luke 17 one more time and here's what the Bible says. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. I want you to write down. I've got three thoughts for you here this morning. I want you to write these down. I'm going to give them to you quickly today. But I want you to know, first of all, that he saved his home by a blessed virtue. He saved his home by a blessed virtue. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Because he learned to live his life and he learned to center his home around purposeful living. They were not living a life of frivolity. They were not living a life of leisure. They were not living a life of convenience. They learned, he said, listen, they may live that way. They may eat and drink and they may uh, heap to themselves as many people as they want. Can I just tell you this? It bothers me uh, that uh, the marriage and the home, the institution, the very first thing that God created uh, in, the, in the garden is being assaulted today and it is being assaulted by people that think, well, I'm done with them. I've fallen out of love and and instead of staying true to my God and instead of staying true to my spouse, we're living in a time where we can throw it away and go get a new one. Friend, it flies in the face of God. I just want you to know that God cares about the home, that God cares about your family, and that God cares about your spouse. It bothers me 
that uh, we're living in a time where people say, and, and when they're counseling, when they're counseling with you, they're not trying to find help. They're trying to find a loophole where they can get out of something. Friend, let me tell you, that ought not be that way. Who's going to, instead of trying to get out, who's going to find a reason to stay in? Tell you this, though, is the danger of pleasure living. Take your Bibles, look with me at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to be coming back to uh, um, here, but uh, I want to show you a couple things here. Hebrews chapter 11, and look with me, please quickly see we're living in a time where we think that our lives are all about pleasure. That's why the American dream, and, and uh, don't misunderstand me, I'm glad for our country. I, I, I bleed red, white, and blue. I love, oh glory, and I love this old land. I, I thank God that, uh, uh, that God has provided us this land. And I believe for, just, for such a time as this because really in reality America is about the only uh, fellowship and the only friend of the nation of Israel. Friend can I tell you I love this country but you need to know that we have dropped our standards, that we have dropped our love of the Lord and that we and, uh, today we are living, we are a nation that is consumed with with pleasures, the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse number 25. This is talking about Moses choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Oh yes, friend, you may say, but I enjoy how the sin makes me feel. I enjoy the feeling. I enjoy the rush. I enjoy the endorphins that are released. I enjoy the excitement. I enjoy the danger. And yes, in Hebrews eleven twenty five, 25 we do find that there is pleasure in sin but the Bible says that that's a pleasure in sin that it's only for a season don't you know that that feeling leaves don't you know that it leaves behind it in its path a place of debauchery it leaves behind it wrecks it leaves behind it terrible things of weapons of mass destruction could never imagine the damage that comes I'm telling you friend yes there is pleasure in sin but it's only for a moment and it surely is not worth it hey don't you know that we ought to keep our eyes on the Lord and that we should not be looking at the temporary things the temporary pleasures but instead looking at the everlasting promises that are given from the word of God there's a danger in pleasure. The Bible also tells us, though, that there's a danger of pride. You see, they were living at that time in uh, Luke 17. We find out that it was all about them. They were self-focused and they were living according to their own whim. They were living according to their own desires. They were living according to their own appetites. They could not tell themselves no. And they, they were prisoners of their own lusts. Then when lust hath conceived. It bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The Bible tells us, though, we ought to beware of prideful living. The Bible says, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Isaiah 13, 11, saying to them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Hey, I'm here to tell you, you don't have to go the way because your way is a way that will lead you into the depths of hell itself. Turn your heart unto the Lord and be delivered by the goodness of God. You need to know that that pride and that arrogance, it flies in the face of God. Matter of fact, can I tell you this? They also had a danger in pointless living. Isn't it something, by the way, in Luke 17 that we see that God um, put, the, as it was in the days of Noah, 
also right next to as it was in the days of Lot. And all of it was filled with debauchery. All of it was filled with perversion. All of it, you better listen to what I'm saying to you. All of it was filled with sexual immorality. All of it was filled with abomination in the sight of God. Isn't it something, by the way, here we are talking about pride. And pride leads to, leads to perversion. Pride leads to that kind of a life. Matter of fact, isn't it something uh, how that everybody talks about pride and these pride parades. Let me tell you something. How about some humble parades? How about some humility in the house of God? Rather than touting our own sexuality which is wicked in the sight of God. Take your Bible. Let me show you something. Ezekiel chapter 16. Turn to it. Ezekiel chapter 16. In Luke chapter 17 we're reading about as it was in the days of Noah. And all they were doing was saying Oh, just let, let me have another wife and let me live like I please. And when I'm done with her, I'll just go get another one. And we live with revolving door around our front door thinking that everything's okay. Let me tell you something, by the way. It, that, that, that flies in the face of God. And we're living in a time where even in churches today that they're living in open marriages and these swinging relationships. Hey, it's wicked in the sight of God. And let me just go ahead and say you need to, there's nothing wrong with being married and sticking with them for the rest of your life amen there's a, let me just say this there's not a lot of that kind of preaching today because it flies against our own desires look at what the bible says here because we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. And let me tell you something. We ought to use Bible language. Everybody says, well, LGBTQ this and LGBTQ that. And it is something how they try and take the rainbow, the covenant sign of God, after Noah came out of the ark. And they take that sign and they have claimed it for themselves from their sexual perversions which is what brought God's judgment on to start with. And they've claimed it for themselves and they still get it wrong. They use a six, they, they use a six color rainbow and God's rainbow is seven colors. They still can't get it right. But look at what the Bible says here. Ezekiel chapter 16 and look if you would at verse number 49. We are told here some very plain things. The Bible says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Listen, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. You need to know, friend, that God's not playing around in this thing. That if ever, ever was sin, and if it ever was an abomination in the sight of God, it still is. Is. Somebody better be teaching our children and teaching the next generation that sodomy, it flies in the face of God. Quit trying to tell your kids that they're gay. You need to use the Bible language. It's sodomy and it's sin in God's sight. Say, preacher, you're full of hate. I'm full of love because God loves them and God wants to save them from their own sin and their sin is no different than the, yours and mine and that it separates us from God. I don't care if it's that kind of sin. I don't care if it's pornography. I, are you listening to me this morning? I don't care if you've got some addiction. I don't care if it's rebellion in your own heart that nobody can see. Every bit of it is sin against God. And the Bible says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Right. Ain't nothing about being mad here. This ain't my law. Come on now. Yes, sir. This isn't my law. I didn't write that book. But I sure do believe it. Say, well, preacher, why are you so upset? I'm not upset. I'm here to tell you there's a way out. 
I'm here to tell you that Jesus died for every sin that man has ever committed and ever will commit. You need to know that that sin has been paid for by the blood of Calvary. Then you say, oh, well, then I don't have to worry about it. Oh, friend, you better, you're going to have to worry about it unless you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Amen. Amen, friend. Woo, praise God. Mm. Matter of fact, we just read, though, that their problem was pride and idleness. You know, we are living in a time where it's all about entertainments. And people are more interested in, even in things like the Grammys and even in things like the Oscars and even in things like this, that, and the other. And we are completely taken in with celebrities and, and everything that they have to say. And by the way, let me just tell you, you want to know what's more important? What's going on in this place right here <laughs> and the worship of God's people. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. Is there another principle? Yes, I'm going to try and hurry. I want to give this to you. Not only do we see that he saved his home by a blessed virtue, he lived his life with purpose. They didn't have any purpose. They were living them, their lives for themselves and they were eating and drinking and, and getting married and giving in marriage and all this kind of stuff. But he lived his, you need to know, well, it's too hard. Things have changed. Let me tell you something. The word of God has not changed. The power of God has not changed. And the provision of God has not changed. And God is here to help you walk for his glory. Second thing I want you to see is here in 1 Peter chapter 3. And look, if you would, at verse number 20. Which sometime were disobedient. When once the long-suffering of God, listen now, waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, listen, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Mm. Boy, this one helps me. Number two, I want you to get, he saved his home by a big view. He saved his home by a big view. Let me say it like this. <laughs> he had learned to live his life not only in purpose, but now we see that he had learned to live his life in preparation. Uh, I want you to write some of these things down. You say, well, what did he prepare? Well, <laughs> he prepared an ark. Matter of fact, the word prepare, it means that he prepared it thoroughly. He didn't just build a structure thing. Well, that'd probably be good enough. Go ask some people that are living in Turkey right now if their construction was good enough. Hmm. You better know that I've got my feet planted on a foundation. <laughs> That'll never go bad. <laughs> I've got my feet on something that ain't going to shake. <laughs> I've got, you need to know that when those things that cannot be shaken may remain, there is no foundation other than that which God, Jesus Christ, has laid. And you need to know you better have your feet on something that cannot move. Let me give this to you quickly. He prepared an ark, but he also prepared an attitude. <laughs> now, look, look, uh, look at this uh, again. And also take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 18. While you're turning there, though, let's, uh, I'm going to give you this thought. He created an attitude. You say, well, who? Who was there with him? His wife and his sons and his sons' wives. You want to know what we don't find in there? No, I'm not saying that they didn't have any bad days. I'm not saying <laughs> that they always got along real good. I ain't saying all of that. I don't know. But I tell you what, you don't find them ever fighting. Amen. You don't find in here where there was str a struggle. You don't find in there where uh, uh, Ham, Shem, and Japheth came and said, well, we don't like those uh, blueprints. You don't ever see that. They had learned that attitude is important. 
Let me tell you, all you kids that are here this morning, you better learn to have a good attitude. I'm going to point at each and every one of you. You better learn how to have a good attitude. Sarah's by her mom. Come on now, is everybody all right? Amen. You better learn to have a good attitude because you need to know that the commands that Noah got, they were not commands that Noah thought up. They were commands that God gave. And you ought to thank you. You ought to thank God for a mom and a daddy that want to teach you in the right way. You ought to thank God for a mom and daddy that allow you to come to the house of God. You ought to thank God for a mom and daddy that will get you in trouble when you need to be in trouble. Amen. Come on now. Don't look at don't look, don't look at me like that. I'm trying to help you home. Look at this. Genesis chapter 18. Are you there? Genesis chapter 18. Let me look at it. Genesis chapter 18. I love this verse. If I can ever find it. Verse number 16. Uh, verse, verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Listen, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. By the way, mom and dad, you better make sure that you keep a good attitude in the house. Say, well, pastor, we've been struggling. That's why you better learn, like old Barney said, better learn how to nip it in the bud. Can I get an amen? amen? Because you need to know right now that you're not only doing this for now, you're doing this for years down the line. And if you're going to have a good attitude years down the line, you better learn how to take care of business when you need to. Come on now, somebody say Amen. That's exactly right, and that is good preaching. And you don't find a lot of that out there today. You're not going to find that in these big mega churches, and you're going to find that. Are you listening? You, you say, well, what do they know? They don't know anything. That book still works, and the Word of God is still true. You say, well, I don't know if I like that. I don't care if you like it or not. You better learn to embrace it because that's God being good to you and to show you this is the way, walk ye in it. This is the way of life. This is the way of love. Isn't it something? <laughs> How, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. By the way, let me say it like this. It doesn't mean that there might not be years of wandering. But when he's old, He'll know. By the way, can I get a witness right here? Is it just me or is it the older I get, it seems like the smarter my dad was? How many of you know what I'm talking about? I used to think there was some things he was real stupid about. You need to be quiet. But the older I get, the more I say, you know what? He actually knew quite a bit. Them old, those gray head, that gray-headed man that I love so much now, we didn't always see eye to eye. But boy, the older I get, the smarter he gets all the time. And now you know what I do? I'll call him up and I'll say, Dad, I've got an issue. i got something I need some help with. Dad, I need some counsel. Dad, I need some wisdom. Dad, I need some direction. Dad, I don't know what to do. Dad, how did you do that when you went through it? Because it's not near as easy as what I thought it was. Amen. But boy, this right here. Man, when you look in here and you find out, <laughs> it's a eight. And here's what I wanted you to get because I said that this had to do with having a big view. It says in there, didn't it? It says that there's few. We're in eight souls. We look at that and say, that's all? It wasn't that, that was all for him. He's like, man, this is everything. Those eight souls represented, come on now, they represented the world to him. 
Come on now. Do you realize at that time they were the world? Think about it. Can you get any bigger than a world view? And let me tell you this. He saw the world view through the life of his children. Mm. Well, it's just a few. No, friend. This is everything. Can I tell you this? If it, we in America, if we would get our homes figured out, we get a whole lot of everything figured out. But we'd better do this thing according to the word of God. I'm trying to hurry here. Second Peter. Turn to Second Peter. Second Peter. Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. I mean, look at that. Second Peter chapter two and verse number five. Here's what the Bible says. Well, let, let's read verse four. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Listen, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah. What does it say? The eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. Is that right? By the way, I want, I, want, I want you to see this. So we see, first of all, <laughs> we see, first of all, that he had, he, he, he saved his home by a blessed virtue. He lived his life with purpose, even in a purposeless world. But number two, we see that he saved his home by a big view. He said, I just ate people. Let me tell you, it was the world. And it was all of his world. And you need to start looking at your children, your grandchildren, as being your world. Third thing I want you to see, he saved his home by a benevolent value. Now, here's what I mean by that. He lived his life preferring others. What, what, what did it say about him? It says that Noah was the what? The eighth person. In a lot of places, let me tell you what, the, there's a whole lot. Well, I'm the leader of this clan. But it wasn't Noah. He said, well, there's wifey. And then there's Ham and, oh, his wife. She's a precious young lady. By the way, she had parents that weren't right. She had a whole family that never made it in. Ham and Shem and Japheth. He said, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Everybody's all right. Okay. I'm number eight. He was the eighth. He wasn't number one, Brother Allen. He was number eight. Let me tell you, we need to start looking, we need to start preferring others before us. Can I get an amen? The Bible says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. By the way, can I tell you this? We ought to have that same spirit toward, toward those that don't believe in God. Just because if you're saved today, you ought to thank God for it, but it doesn't make you better than anybody else. Come on now. We need to start preferring other people. I'll never forget the story about Mr. Spafford when he wrote... That song, It Is Well With My Soul. There's also another one. There was a preacher on that Titanic. And when that Titanic started going down, he started going out and he started telling everybody, for those of you that are saved, take off your life vest and give it to someone that's unsaved. He took his own off and gave it to someone else. And the story is told of a man that ended up in the icy waters that night. And he said, some man came floating by him. And he said, friend, do you know that Jesus is your Savior? And he said, no, no. He said, I'm not thinking about all of that right now. He said, let me tell you, this is your chance. You need to know that Jesus is the only way. And he floated away 
to tell other people. He said I, he could hear him talking to others and preaching in those cold waters that night. And he said it wasn't too much longer later where that man came floating back by his way. He said, have you believed? Have you believed? He said, no, I have not. He said, this is your time. This is your chance. And he said, when he went away, he said, I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. And he said, I was that preacher's last convert <laughs> before he died in the icy waters that night. Can I ask you, do you care for others? Let me say it like this. Uh, look at that verse again there, St. Peter 2 and verse number 5. Boy, I love this, uh, this verse. And the Bible says here, listen, spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. I'll tell you this, though. Old Noah, he had something here he couldn't pass up. He also had something that he had to pass out. The Bible says here that he was a preacher of righteousness. Whether or not anybody else gets saved, it's your job to tell them. It's your job to share. It's your job to testify that God loves all sinners. But I tell you this too, he also had something that he could pass down. Do you see it here? Uh, chapter, chapter 2 verse 5. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, here's, here's, here's what the Bible, I, th I believe, oh, it's Hebrews chapter 11. This is our main text that we've had all month. Hebrews 11, listen carefully to this. Here's what it says in verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir. Is that what it says? And became what? Heir of the righteousness which is by faith. <laughs> Boy, I love that. By the way, let's have our musicians come. Here's what I want you to get. He became heir. In other words, this became something. This faith became something that he could pass down. If he was heir, who do you think, uh, who else would be heir? Come on now. Oh, I'm not talking, I don't believe you can get saved for anybody else. But let me tell you, you want to know one of the reasons why I'm here tonight <laughs> is not because <laughs> I'm good and not because Daddy saved me. But I tell you this, after I accepted Jesus Christ to be my Savior, my dad did pass some things on to me. And I've got the faith. I, I'm not talking about my salvation, but I am talking about my creed. I am talking about my hope. I am talking about the way in which we go and my faith in Christ. If he became an heir of righteousness, then he was able to pass that on to the next generation. Got a question. What are you passing on to the next generation? And do you have your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren in your target view to say, hey, I want to have something that I can pass down to the next generation. I hope it's not just money. I hope it's not some, just some jewelry. I hope that you can give them a faith. I tell you, one of the things I love to hear from you all is to hear about things that have been passed down to you. Brother Mike, it's been more than one person that's told me about your mama. Heard a lot about her. Amen. Come on now. There's someone, you remember? Because I see some of you nodding. You're just like, I can tell you about my mama. I can tell you about my granddad. I can tell you about people in my past. I can tell you what, and I'm grateful for the blessing of their faith and what it has brought out and what it has borne out in my life. Why don't you do the same thing for somebody else? With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's all stand here this morning. I want to ask you, if you died right now, where would you go? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Do you know? Do you know?
Do you know that you're saved? Is there anyone here today, you say, Pastor, there is no doubt about it. I know for sure that Jesus is my Savior. I've asked Him. I've put my faith in Him. Anybody like that all over the building? God bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You can put your hands down. Is there anyone here? You'd say, Pastor, I know I need to be saved. I know I need to be saved. And I'd like to be saved. If that's you this morning, would you raise your hand? Pastor, I'm not saved. But I'd like to be saved. Why don't you accept Him today? Would you do that? Would you ask Jesus to be your Savior? All right, in just a moment, I'm going to have you come forward. We'll take the Bible and show you what the Bible says. Maybe you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, God spoke to my heart about something. Oh, I want, my, I want to save my home. I want to live my life, my home with purpose. I want to live my life in preparation. I want to live my life uh, with them in view. I want to live my life looking and saying, oh, they're my world. I want to live my life saying, I'm, I'm the eighth. I'm the last. They're the ones that are important. Maybe there's something else that God spoke to your heart about. But if you be honest, you say, Pastor, God spoke to me about something today. Would you pray for me? Put your hand up all over. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. And if God spoke to your heart, would you come today and speak to him? Lord, we love you. Help us to live this life for your glory. In Jesus' name.